This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Harry Raisner in New York and Eric Severide at the Kennedy Space Center, Roger Mudd in Washington, Daniel Shore in Washington, Bill Plant in Chicago, Bob Barr in Chicago, and Peter Kalischer in Paris. Good evening. Countdown continues here with that almost deceptive ease that we've come to expect of these Apollo launches. Everything tonight on schedule, or perhaps just a bit ahead. Russia's curiously timed unmanned space probe, that Luna 15, the day closer to the moon, arrival now expected on Thursday. But we're not much closer to knowing what it's supposed to do there. Unofficial sources in the Soviet space program are saying that that ship carries a detachable robot capable of certain tasks. But whether that means an attempt to bring samples of the moon back to Earth remains a mystery. Incidentally, the Soviet Union won't be represented among those messages Apollo 11 will leave on the moon. The Russians were invited to send the text, but they declined. The astronauts spent the day on what we might call a gym and sim, calisthenics and then more simulator workouts. CBS will broadcast a live news conference by the astronauts immediately following this program. In our series of reports from the nation's space centers, we've seen how the astronauts will prospect the moon and how they will make their own return to normal society from another world. But what are the material they bring back from the moon? Our report tonight is from Houston. The Lunar Receiving Laboratory at Houston, Texas. Here, within the next two weeks, will come the only really priceless stones mankind has ever possessed. Stones beside which the Kohinoor and the Star of India are dime store gym cracks. Into this sealed laboratory will come two steel suitcases of rocks packed by the Apollo 11 astronauts on the moon. Just outside the glass wall of the rock handling lab, I spoke with the man in charge, P.R. Bell, chief of NASA's Lunar and Earth Sciences Division. Uh, Mr. Bell, once these uh, samples are returned, once the splashdowns occurred in the Pacific, uh, the samples are then flown to you here in Houston, mm -hmm. is that it? Uh, a complicated process of getting them out without contain danger of contamination as they're bagged up in bags which are slightly evacuated and sealed and then they're dunked out through a sterile solution and so on. Then they fly them in here in special packing cases. All that takes place aboard the carrier? Yes, in the mobile quarantine facility. Mm -hmm. And then the material is flown here. Now, is this all done with great speed? I mean, is, is this a, well, a dramatic a, scene of men rushing couriers from one place to another? We're trying to get them to rush as best they can, safely, that is, because, of course, some of the things are changing as the time goes. The radioactivity induced in the samples on the lunar surface by the cosmic rays is dying away. It's, it's decaying as they go. So if they don't get it here before some of those are gone, we'll never measure them. How, uh, what, what will the time span be from splashdown to the time you start looking at the rocks here? Well, if we don't have any bad luck, it's about 24 hours. Now, the sample arrives here in this very room. What happens in there with all of that complicated well, machinery? This is the vacuum laboratory. Uh, the samples come in in these vacuum sealed containers, and we sterilize the outside of them and sort of clean up the earth bugs off the outside. Then we take them into the vacuum system and open them up in vacuum. So we can look at the rocks and chip off pieces and select parts of the fines material for the quarantine tests, which are going on. And also little bits of it for the mineralogy and petrology testing, gross chemical properties and rare gases attached to the material and organic, volatile organic compounds in it and many other things we want to know about it. Uh, how, how do they work with it in the vacuum chamber? Through well, manipulators or...? Uh, in this case, no. There are two spacesuit arms let into the side of the chamber. Uh, now, spacesuit arms leak too much to go into an ordinary vacuum system, so you get an overglove over the outside, and the space between them is pumped by other pumps, so they don't leak in and spoil the vacuum. But you can work in there like the astronaut does on the lunar surface. Not as conveniently, but safely enough. We've got more time. Well, now, with that sort of arrangement, how many people are going to be in this room? How many people are actually going to work well, with these moon rocks? Well, there will be an order of 30 to run this complex, but uh, there won't be very many of them. There will be one man working the gloves, of course. And he gets only a couple hours, and then there's another man to take his place because it's hard work. How soon will it be before uh, the scientists of the world uh, can handle a piece of moon rock and take a look at it and say, there yeah. it is in my hands? Well, it's only after the end of the quarantine interval here. After they've gone through the quarantine tests and found out the material doesn't contain any harmful 
organisms, then we can release it, and pieces of it can be distributed to the scientific community. There's quite a lot of uh, principal investigators waiting for these materials. And that'll be something like, oh, 50 days or 80 days after the sample arrives here, depending on how well the quarantine tests go. We're talking about, uh, the space agency is talking about making these flights to the moon perhaps every couple of months uh, during the remainder of the Apollo oh! program, two or, every two or three months. Uh, would you be able to uh, finish your experiments on this first bunch of rocks so that you could uh, direct the Apollo 12 crews to what you wanted to find out on that mission? Not if they fl flew in two or three months. I think the, the idea is, of course, that if 11 doesn't bring back any rocks, then they'll fly the other in a few months. But if it does bring rocks, they're going to wait like four months. We do hope, because if we have one mission here, it would be most difficult to handle another in times less than that. And even then, we'll only have the most meager of information for the next flight. Our information will be most useful on the flight following that in any case. Right. Uh, we'd sooner they were a little... Uh, we need more space in between in order to be able to, to do it properly. Eric Severide is at the Kennedy Space Center tonight and has some thoughts on the significance of the moon mission of Apollo 11. Eric? Several hundred thousand of the world's three billion human beings will be crowded here on this flat canopy of sand and sea for the next couple of days. And a fair proportion of the rest of the species will be watching. Human history comes to a point here at the Cape. Every mortal soul is involved in this breakover moment in time. Nothing can ever be quite the same again, the moon, the earth, man's notion of himself, or the use of his energies. This is just the beginning, perhaps, of a new stage in the evolution of the species, something comparable to the first crawling of the first amphibian creature out of the primeval swamp onto dry land. The great spire stands there like a modernized Gothic cathedral. And like the medieval cathedrals, this mobile temple was built by a special breed of anonymous artisans, thousands of them, who will then move on from site to site as the high priests of this new religion of space instruct them. A hundred years ago, Jules Verne imagined that the spit of sand called Florida would be the site. He knew Americans would be the first, because, he said, the Yankees are engineers just as the Italians are musicians and the Germans metaphysicians by right of birth. There is another reason for it. Virginia Woolf, a European, said, we have shadows that stalk behind us. They, the Americans, have a light that dances in front of them. They face the future, not the past. For now, the moon is the dancing light, but behind the Americans who will try to touch it lie several thousand years of the past. The ancient Egyptian astronomers, Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, the early Russian rocket theorists, the British with radar, and the modern Germans and Russians. Engraved on that plaque that Armstrong and Aldrin will place on the moon is one sentence that might have been different. We came in peace for all mankind, it says. It might have said, we were sent in peace by all mankind. Very. That's.